All right, so here we are. We're gonna resume here where we are. Boom. Okay, so Ajax allows you to do dynamic uh, updates of page components uh, instead of the entire page. And the basic framework is always a request response cycle. So the page initiates some kind of uh, request that says, hey, I wanna do this, this is the data I want. And then the data source delivers that data. And you can pull data either from the same server that the page is stored on or from some kind of outside sources. Uh, as we'll see in a minute though, pulling from outside sources can create some difficulties. And the data that you get, right, inevitably it's gonna be a string of numbers because that's what computers send, but it can be formatted in anything from binary data uh, to JavaScript objects to XML documents and uh, other things. So very nice, very flexible, very useful, uh, widely used for this, uh, purpose of, again, dynamically updating portions of pages. So the core element of AJAX is this thing called an XML HTTP request. Okay, so XML we've seen, it's an object description language. HTTP, that's Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that's the standard way to send data over the internet. And the request just means you're asking for something. So HTT, uh, XML HTTP requests have a certain number of methods and properties built in. So this is already part of the JavaScript language, so you don't need to specify any of these yourself. They're already there. Just like we saw with Canvas and Context, there's a bunch of uh, methods that are already built into that context object. So standard ones, uh, number one, specifying the request, right? So you have to have a way to describe what the request is, and that's your open method. So if we look here at my code, which I'm gonna, lift here let's see right here this is the uh the code that i have on my doug corp site right here this load image function this is the one that does the uh that does the ajax i'm gonna slide that down a bit let's blow this up so you all can see it better okay so first we create our XML HTTP request object. It's called OREC, okay? Uh, we're going to affiliate it with a file. We're gonna specify what file we're loading from. And then we're gonna call this open method. So the open method, first of all, we specify what kind of operation we're doing. And in this case, we're doing a get operation. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. Then we send along the string as the file name, right? The file path in this case. So the folder and then the file within the folder. And then this true, this last one can be a true or false value. It uh, means asynchronous. So if you're saying true, that means you're contacting the server in an asynchronous way. That means that, sorry. That means that even if the server isn't currently available, the rest of your application can go about its business and can keep on running smoothly. If you have that set to false, then whatever delay there is there at the server, your program is gonna halt for that time. So in most cases, if you wanna keep your program running smoothly, you're gonna pick true for that. But that too creates some extra complications we'll talk about in a minute. Then, right, the response type. This specifies the format that the response data is going to be received in. Okay, so I'm going to say I want it as an array buffer, which is just going to be a long slug of numbers. Uh, we'll go back to the slides in a second here. And pull this back up. Okay. All right. Uh, response type specifies the data format. Uh, the response is, of course, the data returned in the response. So again, if I go, whoop. if I look at uh, when I actually load it, so the onload method here, that specifies something that happens after the actual data is all received, right? So none of this is gonna get started until the data is received. It wouldn't make sense to try to process this array buffer before I actually have the data. Okay, then uh, the response is just the data that I'm receiving. Okay, so this, is, this just specifies, this is what is going to happen once I get the data. And then last, I send the request. Okay, so I send the request. I'm not sending along any special parameters for how it's gonna get processed. It's just gonna get done in the default way. That's what that null means. Okay, these other methods, uh, this function called display, 
that just shows the image. So here I, uh, I pull all the image data as the array buffer. That's what I'm sending along here is this uh, parameter AB. And this stuff, I'm converting that array data into uh, basically an RGBA set. So RGB, 24-bit color, and then A for alpha is another bit. So I take all that data and I apply it the same way I've done before to the canvas, I use the put image data method for the context, and I copy all that data over. So that's why it appears on the screens. I can, uh, I can lift a particular image. This one that I lift to start the game off is Tokyo, okay? But uh, if I called this image method on subsequent levels, I could pull different ones. I could rotate through Chicago and Kansas City, and I'll eventually add in some extra skylines. Okay, so that's the basics of Ajax. So these things, open, send, response type, response, onload, they're all built into the Ajax code itself. You don't need to do anything special with them. Anytime you're involved with uh, an XML HTTP request object, you automatically have access to all these methods and attributes. And a link down there has a little bit more data about these things. Okay, so standard uh, simple implementation, right? This is basically what I did with a little bit of notation. So in this case, again, get is the operation, uh, chai.bin, right? Resources, chicago.bin, that is the file that I'm pulling from and true means asynchronous. And the rest of this is basically uh, simplified code from what I did earlier. Okay, the two basic ways in Ajax to pull data are get and post. There are some other things that you can do, but get and post are the basic ways to pull data. So get is gonna be read only. It just pulls data from the source. It never does anything to that data. So if you want to absolutely ensure that your application does not somehow result in an outside guy changing what's on the server, get is probably the one you want to do. Post is a little bit more flexible. Post can either do read or writes. Although, of course, if you wanna write something on your server, uh, you need to have the code in place on your server to do it. All the post is going to do is send the instructions for what's supposed to happen. But in order to make the action actually happen, you want something like PHP, uh, a server-side script to actually make it happen. And I don't use any post in my examples because I don't actually have access to the Yola server. I mean, I could have set up some kind of cloud system you know, I have an Azure account. I could have done something there, but I haven't done it. So, uh, yeah, it's not there. Uh, there are some other Ajax options. There are some standard ones, put, delete, and patch. Those in various ways can edit what's on the server. Uh, before you do anything with those, you should definitely know what you're doing and, you know, be very cautious in letting outside uh, site visitors execute any of those commands, right? Once again, Make sure you know what you're doing before you put that in any sort of serious place. Now, if somebody went into Yola and destroyed all my shit there, it wouldn't really matter, right? All that stuff I could slap together again pretty quickly. But, you know, in a real world situation where you're actually concerned about the data you have, yeah, uh, letting outside users manipulate what's on the server is obviously a pretty big concern. So anyway, even though those Ajax, Ajax options exist, yeah, don't really worry about them, right? If you uh, need to know more about them because you end up being the sort of person that writes this code, that's great, they'll be there for you. Okay, so key differences between get and post. Uh, number one, all else equal, get requests are typically faster, post requests are a little bit more complicated. So if you wanna just pull some data, it's very simple. You've, you've seen there's like four lines of code in there to make it do what it needs to do. Post requests are a little bit more complicated and because you know it can do more things, the code on the server side is gonna look into a little bit more detail about what's going on there. So they're not typically going to execute as quickly. The other thing, post is a bit more secure. So anytime you're using a get query, right? You're gonna specify what sort of information you want. That get query gets sent along to the server with all the various details about it. And, uh, by default, that's going to be logged and stored in the server. So if you're concerned about any access, any aspect of that, then yeah, maybe you want to use POST. POST is by default not going to keep all those details on the server. Now, having said that, neither one is a guarantee, right? You can specify your server so that this basic get data does not get recorded. You could uh, set 
your server so that the post data does get recorded. So it's not a guarantee, it's just this is what the default settings are. Uh, get request requests do have a smaller data capacity than post. They can't send out uh, the whole slug of data. But if you're bumping up against that limit, the limit is pretty big. And if you're bumping up against that limit, well, chances are you should probably just reload the page anyway. Uh, but the more important thing, get is going to use locally cached data to work faster. So if your browser has already downloaded some data, it's going to use what's available in the cache as opposed to downloading it again from the server. And that's designed to make your system work more efficiently. It's good for you because you get your data quicker because it's already there on your machine. It's good for the server because the server doesn't have to respond uh, separately to the same repeated request. On the other hand, post, post is always gonna pull fresh data from the server. So if you think something that you're looking at might've changed, for example, if it's not a static image, it's a, some kind of dynamic data, then yeah, maybe you want to use post just to make sure you get the freshest available data. Or at least, you know, you maybe don't want to use get all the time. You periodically sprinkle in some posts with your string of gets. Okay, so those are some things to be aware of. Uh, you know, if you guys try any of this on your own and you're like, wow, I have this data on the server that keeps changing, but whenever I use the get method, it never changes on my web page. Well, the reason why is it's using what's cached in your browser. Okay. Now, common pitfalls in terms of performance. Again, if you guys are playing around with JavaScript and you're wondering how come these things aren't working as well as I was hoping, you know, as you were hoping they would, well, again, basic uh, pitfall checks. So number one, don't put too much code in the event methods, right? Those event methods get called at uh, very short intervals, like many times a second. So, I'm sorry, I was trying to drop out to my source code here. So for example, in mine, I have some methods here for when the mouse crosses the screen and like this, this M is an event that checks the uh, mouse coordinates. This thing is gonna get called, you see how quickly the mouse moves, right? It's getting called many, many times a second. So if I tried to do some actual graphical routines in here, this would be a big problem. This method would uh, always just be, uh, would be slow and sludgy, right? So all the graphics would look terrible because everything would be waiting on the mouse events to happen. But if I do these methods outside, right, it can happen sort of asynchronously. So there are certain things like, for example, this check bump method that I do here that checks if the two things, if my uh, cursor is bumping into one of the slugs, I can do this in another method. And even though the mouse method is getting checked repeatedly, this check bump method will get called so, sort of separately. So anyway, JavaScript isn't truly multi-threaded, but it can often feel like it's multi-threaded. And that's basically what's going on. Okay. Uh, number two, if code should definitely only execute after the request is completed, use onload. Otherwise, you get the problem that your request could be pending as the program rolls on, right? So these uh, program uh, statements, they execute in a matter of microseconds, whereas the page load, right, the component loads, even if they're pretty fast, they're, you know, typically many milliseconds. So what you don't want to have happen is you try to download some file and you're doing some operations involving that file, but the rest of the program has already gone past it. It's tried to do those operations before the file is in, and it treats that data array as a bunch of zeros. So for example, if you're trying to do it with an image, you'll just see a big uh, black rectangle where your image should have been because all of those uh, pixel data are just going to be zeros. Uh, number three, don't pull the same data more than once, right? If you know your program is gonna pull the same data over and over, uh, if you're gonna reuse it, store it in some kind of appropriate data structure. So for example, in my game, right, in Slugfall here, I wanna actually go to Slugfall. In Slugfall, I download this image each time, right? But if I were gonna download it for every time I have to uh, change levels, that will slow things down, right? And especially if I download it repeatedly for various refreshes, but I don't do that. Oh, there we go. Boom, and it's fading back to Tokyo. Oh, that's what's going on. Okay, yeah, I didn't update my array. Okay. Anyway, but you don't wanna download this data repeatedly. Uh, now, if you use a get method, 
that's going to solve one problem of it, right? It's going to use cache data. But the other thing, since I'm using it as background, what I want to do, that was Kansas City there. What I'm doing as background, uh, I save it in an array data structure. So this, this array data is a big array that instead of uh, having to repeatedly redraw it or pull the data and look at it to compare when I'm doing the refresh when I fade the screen back to normal, instead I have it here and it's kept in RAM and it works a lot faster. So you wanna save the data in some kind of data structure uh, if you're going to be constantly rechecking it uh, as opposed to repeatedly reloading it. You never wanna reload it that fast. You don't even want to reload it from your own RAM. Right, you don't want to have to pull it from your browser cache repeatedly. Okay. Anyway, uh, last thing, if you have Ajax code, you typically want to test it live on a server. Um, the reason is uh, there are gonna be a lot of blockages that are gonna happen if you try to do it on your own machine. And that can be a very frustrating thing if you don't know what you're doing. So typically what's gonna happen if, for example, you try to access some things on your own machine using Ajax, the browser is gonna think, oh, this is weird. You're trying to access something in your own personal data by, you know, directly from some website. It doesn't know that that website is something that you're actually controlling at the time, right? It thinks, oh, here's some random web page trying to dig into your files. Uh, no, we're not gonna allow that. Now there are ways that you can permit it to happen, but you know you probably don't want to mess around with your security settings like that if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so one possibility, again, if you want to try out some of this Ajax stuff yourself, you can set up a, an account on some free hosting service like yola.com. Uh, again, it's free and it's perfectly fine for small scale usage, right? I mean, you wouldn't want to be starting a uh, large scale business on there. It isn't good for that. But if you're just doing a few pages to try some stuff out to like, you know, test some little uh, applications. Yeah, it's fine for that. Okay. And then you'll get around these uh, Ajax security limitations. All right. So let's talk these data access limits. So way, way back when, right, circa 1990, web pages were read only, right? You'd go to a website, you'd download the page, there it was, you'd look at it. They didn't have these security issues around active content because active content didn't exist. So there were no problems. But once active content rolls around, then you end up with the basic problem of verifying that the person who's trying to do stuff actually should be allowed to do it. So draw a little paint here, da, da, da. right? So this is you, or say it's the client. This is a server, right? So again, circa 1990, it was very simple. You launch the request, server delivers the web page, right? Very simple. But, 1995, this active code starts being a thing, then you have some interesting problems, right? So once again, you can still launch the request and the server can send you the page, but now the page looks like this. Whoop. Now the page looks like this. There's gonna be some, damn it. There's gonna be some active portion in here and this active portion could go to whoop, could go to another machine, right? Could go to some completely different machine, and then what's happening? We don't know. Okay, so this is the basic problem. You have to verify that whatever machine is accessing your stuff has, you know, legitimacy to do that. This is a problem. Okay. So what are some typical things that could happen? Well, number one, you could get connected to a machine that you didn't intend to get connected to, right? Some malicious uh, operator out there. Uh, also, 
that malicious operator could potentially have remote access to your machine, right? You've probably at least heard of various uh, security threats that can hijack whatever's going on on your machine. They can actually take control of your machine. And the user could potentially cause unintended changes to server contents, right? If there is some uh, dynamic portion on your page where you can enter something, yeah, you could potentially cause unforeseen changes to the server side. Now, browsers are different. The very, one of the subtle differences between browsers, they're going to have different default security settings and they're going to give users more or less latitude to override them. So. One of these things, right, here's a Stack Overflow, and if you don't know it already, Stack Overflow is your friend. So here's a typical question, Ajax request to the local file system isn't working in Chrome, right? The basic thing, you have something in Ajax, you want to access the user's file system. In general, these kind of things where you access your own file system, you're gonna have to do that as a response to some user action. For example, there could be some input field on your screen that selects what file you're going to do, the user selects the file, and then the web service can have access to your machine. But in terms of security, unless the user has actually approved that access, it's generally going to be forbidden, right? And there's a good little blurb down here. Uh, where is this one? Yeah, so simple thing here, right? Firefox allows the request because it accepts requests to a local file system if they also originate from there, but Chrome denies all of these requests to file URLs. Uh, you can't make an Ajax request to the local file system from an external domain in either browser, right? From some outside source, uh, because it would be a massive security flaw if you could. You don't want just any random website to be able to just walk up and access the internals of your machine, right? That would be horrible. Okay, so that's uh, the basic access limit. Now, how do we phrase that? It's what's called the same origin policy. So if you have a script running on one page and it wants to access data on another page, the basic rule is the access is permitted if A and B have the same origin, which means the same scheme and host and port. So basically from the same kind of uh, communication mechanism, from the same website and using the same application port, right? They're part of the same application. Then they'll generally get access. Otherwise, it's going to be denied. So there's actually a little article on Wikipedia that is reasonably good for this. It has a little chart that's nice. So I'll bring it up. Wikipedia, same origin policy. Okay, so they have a nice little thing here. Uh, if you have your URL, HTTP, www.example.com, blah, 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 right? For example, here's some failures. This one looks exactly the same, right? Except it's secure HTTP. So that's not the same scheme, right? This other one, different host. Instead of being www.example.com, it's en.example.com. So it's not part of the same uh, host. Uh, this one, right, different host, different host, uh, others, the, the, por the port is not the same, right, same scheme and host, but different port. So this one is using a different port. This one is using 80 that they specify up here. This one's using 81. Anyway, so if they're not part of the same related operation, basically, they're not going to have access. And this is a reasonable trade-off to say that if you have two pages that are doing the same kind of thing, they might reasonably have access to each other. For example, if you're bouncing around looking at different videos on YouTube, all those pages are gonna be considered to have the same origin, so you don't have to jump through so many, through so many hoops to look at different videos on YouTube. Okay, so again, some additional reading there if you're interested in it, uh, but Anyway, the point is uh, the same origin policy is designed to present, prevent scripts from access, accessing data they shouldn't be able to, which typically means outside their site's ownership. Now, what could happen? What's a typical problem? Well, you might have a malicious site that tries to access your cookies from a different site, right? So how could this uh, 
how could this play out? What am I talking about here? Well, imagine if you're using a social media site. You're using a social media site and your personal information, like your session key, other stuff, that's all stored in a cookie belonging to that site, say Facebook, okay? Now, the user leaves the session open, goes to another site, right? That's fairly typical. We don't always log out of Facebook when we're done using it. Uh, so you leave the session open, but you visit another site. That means your cookie is still going to have your current session information there in your browser. The second site, which is malicious, right? We're putting that in as an assumption. First of all, it might have some script there that's going to try to read cookie data from a variety of popular sites, right? So like major banking sites, major social media sites, maybe email sites, maybe retail sites like Amazon. It's gonna fish around for a bunch of different popular sites. And by doing that, it's gonna find, oh, look at that. You have your social media site. Ha ha, we're gonna lift the cookie for that. And it copies the data, opens its own session with it, starts sending out all sorts of phishing emails through your account, through instant messages to your friends and, you know, chaos ensues. So without the same origin policy, that's the sort of problem that could happen, okay? The malicious site could do any permitted action on the social media site, like again, like some automated process for sending out phishing attacks. That's why you'll often see on Facebook, right, when this sort of problem happens, when people find an exploit, uh, you'll say, oh, sorry, somebody seems to have hacked my account. They've sent out a bunch of emails, but it's not, you know, a bunch of instant messages, but it's not really me. Okay. So, some uh, common attacks in this vein. Uh, number one, cross-site request forgery, or CSRF. That attack basically tricks the user into making some action. Through that action, uh, the user's uh, going to send along all of their cookie data. So when you try to, well, let's try to walk through the process. User is on some site that has cookie data locally. Okay, so the user is on Facebook, okay, visits Facebook, Facebook puts a cookie on their machine, right? User visits the bank, whatever. But say let's let's keep it simple, let's say Facebook. Facebook puts cookie on user's machine containing sensitive info, right? Whatever, like session, like a session key. Okay. So that's, that's what goes on there. Then there's a malicious site, okay? Okay. User visits the malicious site. And that site has a block to change the password for Facebook, right? So for example, this could be a phishing attack. You send an email said, hey, this is Facebook. We have a serious problem with uh, your account. Please log into our secure server so we can verify who you are and begin the account restoration process, right? So user visits the malicious site. Site has uh, some field to change the password, right? I'll call that, a, and it has an input field. Then after the user enters the data, right? The malicious site can actually execute the operation through Facebook, but it also captures the relevant data, right? So this works, the password is one, right? But if you use the pass, you know, enter your email and password, the malicious site can actually send that to Facebook and thereby grab your session key 
and use what you have because when you contact when it contacts Facebook through you all your cookie information is going to send, get sent along so Facebook can verify that it's you so it has a way to look into that uh, similarly if it doesn't want to be that obvious if it just says oh enter in your email for example it doesn't have to be your password but when you enter in just your email to change it the malicious site can again forward that to Facebook the malicious site is going to be able to use your session key to then change your email temporarily to a different one, right? Send that in, update it, and then do some bad stuff and then possibly restore your email to its original one and hope that you don't figure it out for a while. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that the bad guys can do. Uh, yes, it is definitely possible to steal sessions today. It's more difficult, this particular attack, CSRF, it's not that dangerous, but there is something called cross-site scripting that's absolutely possible, it does happen. Uh, but let me mention, right, basic thing about security. In an ideal world, right, with well-designed systems and well-written code, most of the current security troubles whoop, would not happen, okay? But we don't live in a perfect world. Our world is not perfect. Systems are designed by flawed humans. Code is written by, you guessed it, flawed humans okay they're doing the best they can but the code and systems are very complex and not all designers are experienced that's just how life is so they make rookie mistakes and the bad guys are often quite good and they find these things, they find these uh, vulnerabilities and wait for the right time to exploit them for, you guessed it, big bucks. Okay, so these things are definitely possible. Uh, I'll talk about the one that happened uh, with Target a few years ago in a little bit. But this is, this is what it is, most of these problems that happen, these exploits, they are pre preventable. The code could have been written better, the systems could have been designed better, but they weren't. All right. So again, some additional reading if you want to learn a little bit more about how this sort of thing happens. Now, cross-site request forgeries, about, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, they were widely feared as a potential danger. Everybody thought, oh man, once the bad guys figure out how to do this, because this is possible, then there's just gonna be an explosion of horrible things happening. But there were a couple of fairly simple techniques that did a lot to keep this from becoming a huge problem. Number one, the concept of same site cookies. So uh, many, many major sites use the same site cookie technology that basically says, you can only use Facebook's cookie if you're actually on Facebook. So that prevents this problem where the bad guy you know, has a malicious site and tries to get uh, the user to do something through that site and pass it on. Then the cookie data won't be there because it won't be accessible because that malicious site is, for example, not Facebook. The other thing, something called CSRF tokens. So CSRF tokens were random values that get assigned by the server anytime a page loads. So not just for a session on a site, but for every individual load, uh, every individual load of a page. So this data would often be stored within a cookie, but even if the bad guys get hold of the CSRF token, it won't do them any good as far as establishing a new connection with the site because it's only good for that particular page for that particular client, right? So anytime they want to open a new page to do something through that account, they won't be able to because they won't have access to that CSRF token, right? It's essentially a one use thing. Uh, if you're interested, again, uh, some additional reading from Stack Overflow about what CSRF tokens are, how they work, that sort of thing. Okay, but that's what CSRF tokens are. 
Another kind of attack you might have heard of, something called cross-site scripting or XSS. So that's an attack where malicious JavaScript gets injected into typically a non-malicious page, right? Obviously, you could also happen where the page itself is malicious and owned by some bad guys, but yeah, this is a this is a thing. So how it works, basically the page typically executes the script without user action. Uh, so you load the page, there's some malicious JavaScript right in there. What happens? Well, whatever the JavaScript says it's gonna do. And JavaScript, again, is the most common by far, but other languages do sometimes get used. So anything that you can do with JavaScript, you can do with this kind of cross-site scripting attack. So things like reading and stealing cookie data, things like tracking the keys that the user enters, uh, even potentially modifying the web page structure, the document object model, the tree of all the components, and the actual contents of any of those things. Basically, they can completely change the web page layout. And perhaps most dangerous of all, they can launch malicious XML HTTP requests, right? So, for example, they could have some requests to deliver some malware straight to your machine and automatically install it. Yeah, this is bad stuff. So what's the typical process? Well, one possibility is the bad guys hack a web server, right? So there's a web server out there. It's got a bunch of pages on it. Its security isn't that great. The bad guys figure out how to get in there, how to edit some of the pages. They put some malicious code in some of them. Or they can inject a script inside an existing HML tag, right? So the simple case for cross-site scripting would be something like this. Somebody posts a picture on Facebook. I'm gonna to try to grab this. We got this picture, we're gonna fill it up. It's their sunny day at the beach. Look at that, lovely day, right? And down below, there's a bunch of text boxes, right? Da, 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 like this. And people enter code in them, right? People enter text in them. Something like, hey, looks great. Wish I was there. Or, you know, somebody decides to enter in a script tag, right? And the basic way it would work is if there's something like, something like this. So normally it would be good tag, and end out the good tag, right? And then comments go here. That's the way it should work. But when you do this kind of cross-site scripting, you do something like this, right? Here's the original code I'm gonna do in black. Okay, and then the bad guys might do something like this. They might inject this kind of thing. So they're gonna close out this one thing and then Script, right? And there'll be function bad stuff, right? And then close out the script and then do another good tag opening, right? So it's legitimate HTML as far as that goes, but they've included a script in there that's going to do some bad stuff. Okay, some Sim simple things. And as you've seen with this Ajax, the Ajax is not necessarily that uh, cumbersome, right? So it's not like you have to download some 10 meg application that might take a few seconds. It could be literally a few lines of code that does some Ajax that brings in some bad stuff to your machine right away. And the code for that might not be very big at all. It might download so quickly into the page that you don't even notice it. Or it might be, you know, not enough stuff on the page to really trigger any automated security concerns. All right, so cross-site scripting, that's the basic way it works, and it is a very, very serious thing. It is persistently one of the top concerns along with stuff like phishing. So once the bad guys have that, right, once they have access to your stuff, uh, they can do all the usual bad stuff. Another thing, once the bad guys get the bad page, of course, they can do various phishing attacks to get people to go to that page, or you know, what the bad guys often do is they figure out what are the popular things that are being shown on Facebook at any given moment. What, you know, they have access to the web server already. The web server is already compromised. They track which pages are uh, actively being looked at on Facebook. And those are the ones that they put the scripts on when they can. So if you've ever gone to Facebook and clicked on a link for an article 
And then when you see the article, it does some stuff, right? It flashes up some warning screen. It says, your account has been compromised. Please uh, enter in your Microsoft password, you know, in order to resolve this problem. Yeah, that's, you were probably uh, a victim of something like this. In many cases though, users who visit the page get attacked and don't even know it. A typical way this is prevented is something called escaping the HTML, right? So basically you wanna look through any code that people can enter into those sort of uh, text boxes and make sure that it's not actually executable. Uh, one of the things you can do with that, for example, is uh, you know the HTML representation for the space character, right? For space character is, you know, percent 20, right? So that's uh, something that you could uh, implement. Instead of having this space here, you say, well, anytime I see this space in the function, I'm gonna replace that with this 20, right? And even Blackboard does that, I'll show you. So if I try to do an announcement through Blackboard, you can see, let's use this one, doesn't matter which one I use. But if I make an announcement through Blackboard, uh, blah, 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 okay? And I put in stuff here, blah, 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 blah. And I look at the HTML of it, it puts some of the stuff in here, right? Uh, it's already, you know, formatted in HTML, uh, this particular thing isn't, but sometimes if you do, I mean, you can put in, you can put in uh, HTML in there and it's doing a little strange today. Usually I see some of these things like uh, BR, right? I see these things in here. So it'll, it'll put some of this HTML in here. It'll do some escaping on it, but yeah, not everything. Uh, other things like on Yola site, for example, if I do, is this my entire, I wanna show the entire code. I think that's the, yeah, this is the source code. Let me show you, if I dig around through here, I have some uh, files on here. I'll find it bloom. Okay, this one, this is referencing a file, but instead of uh, using the space characters, you'll see there's a lot of percent twenties in there. So this is a file, Bloom's taxonomy of action verbs. And again, they've uh, escaped all the text so that this is what gets shown. All right, so it's more secure to do it that way. Okay, and that'll essentially prevent your code from being executable. Okay, moving on. So again, some additional reading. Uh, if you're wondering, you know, how dangerous cross-site scripting is, yes, the short answer is it is quite dangerous. It is a recurring thing. It's not going away anytime soon. Uh, again, if these systems were well designed and the pages were written more carefully and the servers themselves that the web pages are on were more secure, it would be much less of a threat. But again, we live in an imperfect world. So it's uh, an ongoing concern. Now I'll mention in terms of security, most of these big organizational security problems aren't caused by a single vulnerability. Now, sure, when you read about stuff in the papers, you'll often see that there was some user error that gave away the whole keys to the system, right? For example, there was some admin with privileged access that they clicked on a link in a file and it installed some malware that, in, malware that encrypted their system and rapidly spread out through the entire organization. Yeah, that stuff does sometimes happen, but typically users with privileged access are also more careful. Not saying it can't happen, but more typically is there are a bunch of vulnerabilities already in the system and maybe that one is just the tipping point right so for example you know the uh, the person gets the virus on their machine there ought to be some defenses in the organization so that virus can't easily spread out to everyone else so what you'll often see is that application vulnerabilities compound right so for example there's one input field that doesn't uh, limit the type of input that should be sent in. Some bad guy figures out that if you enter in an arbitrarily long string, some absurdly long slug of text, some weird stuff can happen. And they try out different things like that. Uh, yeah, so if you have a field that uh, 
you know, your system is going to be designed for typical standard cases. And it's entirely possible that your security people could miss the possibility, if you even have security people, that they miss one of these non-standard entries, right? So they say, nobody thinks about, well, what'll happen if somebody just enters in a, uh, you know, a 10 million character string into this input field for somebody's name, right? So anyway, what can happen? Somebody uh, enters in improper data and that can create uh, other vulnerabilities that can be exploited later. And usually you see this compounding of these things that access to one point gives access to another, gives access to another. So for example, the target breach in 2013, right? This was uh, the tipping point, uh, Target and Home Depot uh, within about six months uh, had massive, massive attacks on them, which uh, were a combination of credit card, uh, basically credit card number harvesting through point of sale equipment. So anytime somebody went into a Target or Home Depot and they swiped their credit card through at the checkout, that data could be grabbed and then the bad guys could use it to make counterfeit credit cards. So that's how come these days, basically all the credit cards you see have chips in them to prevent that sort of thing. So that even if the bad guys get that data that's easily captured from a swipe, they don't have the chip. So the system will recognize that they're not actually a real person, right? Now that doesn't prevent everything doesn't prevent, for example, somebody from using a counterfeit credit card to go to the website and order stuff, but it does prevent these point of sale type uh, fraud. Anyway, the way the target breach happened, there was an HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, air, condition, air conditioning. So this firm had legitimate access to target systems. The idea there is target wanted the HVAC people to be able to monitor temperature and quickly change it, uh, change the performance of the air conditioning equipment because if the stores get hot, people don't wanna shop there. So this uh, air conditioning operation had a certain amount of access to Target's sales operations because that way they could say, oh, the sales are you know, busy, the store is getting hot, we can see that the temperature in the store is having a negative impact on sales, any of that kind of stuff could be triggers for the AC people to send out a guy to fix the system, right? So anyway, the HVAC firm had some limited access to target systems and it was legitimate, although possibly ill-advised. What happened, one of the workers at the HVAC firm was successfully fished, right? And basically opened something, opened a file they shouldn't have and got some malware installed on their machine. Well, that allowed the bad guys to have access to target, right? Because they got access to the HVAC guys and thereby they got access to target with that malware. That was the whole point. So the bad guys actually looked at the whole long list of vendors that were doing business with target and actually targeted a lot of them. Eventually one person bit on a phishing attack and that was the gateway in. Then once the bad guys are in target, they were actually able to access targets machines uh, using the default admin ID and password, right? Obviously, that should have been changed, but there was a known default one. The bad guys tried it. Nobody bothered changing it. Boom, they were in. And then there was a known vulnerability on this particular uh, set of server software that the uh, bad guys were able to uh, exploit and install some malware of their own, which eventually was used to harvest all these uh, point of sale data. So there were a whole lot of things that uh, you know, a sequence of vulnerabilities made this possible. Had they all been fixed, right? Had this person uh, not fallen for the phishing attack, wouldn't have happened. Had Target you know, kept its servers more secure, that part wouldn't have happened. Had that known vulnerability been addressed and fixed, the malware wouldn't have been installed, that wouldn't have happened. So usually, again, there's a whole chain of things. But the other side is these organizations are so large and the systems are so complicated People are going to miss stuff. It happens. Okay. Now, one of the ways that uh, systems deal with this sort of problem is, first of all, by making application actions go through layers of uh, data transfers. So, for example, you might have layers here in turn. Whoop. You might have layers for uh, some transaction operation. I'll just draw a bunch of rectangles here. So 
user enters request, right? Stuff you're going to buy, then uh, including some credit card data, right? So, so this transaction involves credit card data. And that data will be sent in, you know, through a bunch of other uh, systems. So it gets sent through the uh, transaction point and then to the credit card company. Okay, and then, I don't know, to some data repository, to some data storage system that tracks that the transaction happens, right? And at each of these points, there could be some potential for malformed data to get through and create a vulnerability. So you want to have very standard ways of doing this as the first thing, right? It's not going to fix everything, but having highly standardized data formats for each of these processes and layers will help, okay? It'll prevent the problem where the system does something unexpected because the bad guys were able to push through an unforeseen format, right? You say the data has to be in such and such format to get from this point to this point. If it's not in that format, the uh, request gets rejected. So one of the ways of doing that, a philosophy is something called a restful service. So a restful service, it stands for representation, represent, representational state transfer. Uh, they're designed with what are called layered stateless data transfers. So stateless means they act the same way regardless of what's going on. They don't track the condition of the state in order to determine how they respond. They're simply designed that they accept some data and they respond regardless of the context in which they accepted that data. And one of the things to, that you need in order to achieve that is a standard kind of data. So things like length, things like the character mix, things like executable code. So if you have a RESTful application, right, it's going to respond in a very standard way as long as the data is correct. Okay. The other uh, thing that's a tech, it's a separate technology. So again, RESTful is uh, more of a philosophy. It's about how you design systems to, be, to work statelessly. Simple object access protocol is a, uh, a more structured way of sharing data between applications. It was developed by Microsoft, uh, it's built around XML. It just says, if you're going to have these uh, SOAP compatible systems, you have to design your objects for data transfer in this particular way. Okay? And that enforces that kind of standardization and data transfer. So what typically happens is that SOAP is really structured and makes you design everything in a particular way it can be a bit of a be a bit of a headache, but because it's more structured, it's also more reliable for transactions uh, that have to observe database acid properties. Basically, acid properties making sure that the database processes everything absolutely correctly, and if there are multiple replicas of the data, it ensures that uh, those replicas are all showing the same value. Things like that. So, SOAP is a protocol. It has a strictly uh, enforced set of rules. REST is more of a philosophy that says, here's how we're going to send data and we're going to do it in a stateless way. And it tends to have better performance because uh, there aren't as many strictures in place. So if you want your data to get processed through quickly, but you're not especially concerned about the integrity of that data, yeah, you might go with a, a RESTful application. But if you're very concerned that your data has to get transferred correctly and nothing unforeseen happens, you might want to use SOAP for that. But to an extent, they're both trying to achieve the same things, right? They're both trying to provide some structure into this sort of uh, sequence of actions to prevent unforeseen consequences from happening. Okay, now, you know, we're basically just touching the tip of the iceberg on this one. There's a lot more you could say about these. So I did include some additional reading. If you're an IDS major, and I imagine many of you are, you should be at least familiar with these two technologies. So something good to know uh, at least a little bit about. I don't know how much they talk about these in uh, you know, classes on down the road, but yeah, these are important topics. 
Okay. So this concludes our formal lecture, but if people have questions, I'm happy, happy to discuss. If anybody's got anything, how y'all doing?